artificial they are intelligence. Dangerous. Artificial intelligence. intelligence. It's been really scary for programmers. Day after day, we're getting these statements from big tech CEOs saying that AI is going to replace coding and that it's eminent, which created a lot of division. Some believe that AI is indeed taking over, some others think it's overhyped and just a passing phase. And the victim is, of course, the new students, rightfully so, is starting to question if studying computer science is even worth it. But are we really getting the full picture? Are these CEOs dropping these wake up calls because they care about our future, or do they have businesses that thrive on AI? I mean, this guy's got a business in AI, so does this guy. And this guy i try to give my opinion on this with knowledge i have now i'm not really a developer i can't speak for all programmers so my main focus will be the their roles so an ex OpenAI employee, Leopold Brenner, claims AGI is coming no more than two years. Now we read his publication titled Situational Awareness where he talks about this in detail and I have some issues with it, especially the part that addresses the energy problem. To me, the power requirement based on what he says seems too unreasonable. Just for the record, 25,000 NVIDIA A100 GPUs were running for over three months to train ChatGPT4. That's equivalent to a Boeing 747 flying for 18 days continuously or powering a large hospital for nearly one and a half years. And that's only a power draw of 7,500 kilowatts, let alone 10 million kilowatts, as he claims to be the requirement for AGI in the span of two years. Given how energy has always been a source of trouble, I can see that it's going to get more and more complicated to convince investors that AI is actually worth the investment, which in my opinion explains a lot about the claims behind the AI hype. Goldman Sachs senior stock analyst wrote, despite its expensive price tag, the technology is nowhere near where it needs to be in order to be useful. He adds, overwhelming things that the world doesn't have use for or is not ready for for typically and badly. It's things like these that make me believe that even if we have AGI, it'll take at least 10 years just to get over the barriers for it to be properly implemented. But even if resources are no longer a problem, there's still a serious discussion that LMs are not the path to AGI, since all we do to improve these models is either adding more data, more hyperparameters, in an attempt to make them generalize well, especially against out of distribution data points. And the problem is that eventually we're run out of data, because it's not really clear yet that LMs can actually reason. We have on one hand research papers like the one showing they passed the Francois Choulet benchmark, which shows glimpses of situational awareness, pun intended. And on the other hand, Apple's recent paper showing that LMs can really reason. So nobody knows whether all they do is recall reasoning versus what we want them to do, which is fresh reasoning. Jan Lacan explains that LMs lack the embodied understanding of the world, which is better captured in math and physics rather than human language. So maybe a paradigm shift is also necessary. I don't know. Nonetheless, I personally think that LMs are great, especially things like Cursor, ChatGPT01. They can obviously code and overall they've been a boost of productivity to good programmers at least. And honestly, a productivity boost usually means partial reply. Placement. And I understand all the talk about how it's just another layer of abstraction, but it's an impressive one. And it's way different compared to the move from assembly to C to Python, because even with Python, you still needed exactness. Whereas with English and LMs, you could just get away with asking loosely and not really knowing what you're talking about, kind of relying on the LM to understand what you're trying to say. But as of right now, I think the biggest impact LMs have is how they're setting up the bar higher for juniors, which begs the question, what does all this mean? mean for you? What should you really do? You the guy who wants to get into data or programming for that matter. There are some good news, some solid reports like the one from the WEF predicting that by 2032 jobs linked with data analytics will have the most growth. Jobs around it like cybersecurity are still predicted to be quite high relevance. But you would be naive if you just rely on some prediction and keep moving the same way as before. The first thing in my opinion you should be doing is to adopt these tools in your daily workflow. And don't just copy and paste the code mindlessly, use it to get up to speed, to ask for explanations, to get lost in technical details. Because technical knowledge, technical knowledge about systems that you're using is never going away. I just guarantee it. Technical knowledge is the key for optimization. If you can't optimize, you're wasting time and resources. Therefore, you're making your company lose money. Therefore, you don't want to be that guy. Trust me. As for learning the code, I think that coding would still be somewhat relevant in the next 10 years, but it's going to get gradually more orchestrative. What do I mean by that? I mean that you'll be leveraging something like Python to call APIs to use services that are already built by AI to solve some specific problem. Let's listen to Andrew Eng and see what he thinks about coding. I think I really want to encourage almost everyone in the world to, to learn to code. I think it'd be worthwhile for definitely all 
many knowledge workers, maybe, you know, pretty much everyone. And I think, well, one society wondered if everyone should learn to be literate. And fortunately, we've moved past that. Today, we still wonder if everyone should learn to code. And I think the answer is yes. I plan to, my kids are a little bit young. I plan to teach them to code when they're a little bit older. Um, and that's because the ability to precisely tell a computer what you want the computer to do for you, to me, that's the heart of coding. It's not about the syntax. I love Python, but it's not about the Python programming language. It's about the skill to take a problem, break it down, and systematically tell a computer what to do. And I do see a strange almost convergence between English and Python, where my Python code now has a lot more English in it because I'm writing prompts to tell an LOM what to do. And then also when I'm writing English for OOM, there's this structured step-by-step, -step, do this, do this, do this, that my English looks, you know, a little bit like pseudocode. But I think the heart of programming is being able to precisely determine and then also tell a computer exactly what you want it to do. Whether you're coding or not, at the end of the day, you'll always be solving problems. It's the one skill needed at any job regardless of AI advancements. That's why I brought you Brilliant, today's video sponsor. I remember about nine years ago when I started my journey in engineering, I was set on building a strong foundation in physics and mathematics. So Brilliant was essential in my routine back then to become well-versed on these subjects. And I think it helped me out a ton. Brilliant is great for sharpening problem solving skills, especially in math, science, and data analysis. The lessons are quick, the explanations are super intuitive, and the courses cover pretty much everything you'll need to know about a given topic. I go to Brilliant whenever there is a topic I find interesting but just don't have the time to learn. And I truly believe this is going to be a worthwhile part of your routine if you want to get into AI, data science, or computer science, since the emphasis here is always that hands on problem solving framework. So if you're interested, use the top link in the description, brilliant.org slash data sensei to get a 30 day free trial plus 20% off of your annual subscription. Big thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. To be honest, no matter how I see it, tech is the fastest growing thing. It's one of the most revenue generating industries. So by getting into tech, whether it be programming or AI, you'll gain leverage and you'll have a far better positioning compared to anybody who's not in tech, which will allow you to take advantage of opportunities should they come in. And this is not some wishful thinking. This actually happened with the creators of Devon. These guys were lead comparative programmers. They obviously knew how to code. And when the world was all AI hype, they took advantage of that. I'm gonna leave you out with an interesting clip from Andrew Ang that show how AI can allow for tech to target on tab domains. Let me now share my thoughts on what are some of the AI opportunities I see. This shows what I think is the value of different AI technologies today. Um, and I'll talk about three years from now. But the vast majority of financial value from AI today is, I think, supervised learning. And then generative AI is the really exciting new entrant, uh, which is much smaller right now. The size of these circles represent the value today. This is what I think it might grow to in three years. So supervised learning, already really massive, may double, say, in the next three years. From And generative AI, I think, will much more than double in the next three years because of the amount of developer interest, the amount of venture capital investments, the number of large corporates exploring applications. But if you look at where the value of AI is today, a lot of it is still very concentrated in consumer software internet. Once you go outside tech, there's some AI adoption, but it, but it all feels very early. So why is that? And it turns out that about 10, 15 years ago, various of my friends and I, we figured out a recipe for how to hide hire, say, 100 engineers to write one piece of software to serve more relevant ads and apply that one piece of software to a billion users and generate massive financial value. So that works. But once you go outside consumer software internet, hardly anyone has 100 million or a billion users they can write and apply one piece of software to. These are some of the projects I see and I'm excited about. I was working with a pizza maker that was taking pictures of the pizza they were making because they needed to do things like make sure that the cheese is spread evenly. So this is about a $5 million project, but that recipe of hiring dozens of engineers to work on a $5 million project, that doesn't make sense. So in other industries, I'm seeing a very long tail of tens of thousands of let's call them $5 million projects that until now have been very difficult to execute on because of the high cost of customization. 